All right, gang, you know what it is. Two, six, ready, set, go. About to run through these problems because you understand everything we're doing from the first two modules. And really, module two is just building off of module one just with new titles. So what's going on here? Comparing linear and exponential models. Oh, I know a lot about these. Linear can be written as y equals mx plus b. Occasionally, when it's feeling fancy, it takes on point slope form y equals m parentheses x minus x1 plus y1 exponential as a times b and then x is taken to some power. Usually x is on the outside, but we soon see that it's not. So what's up with this type of growth? This is linear for sure. This is exponential for sure because it's mapped out similar to what I wrote here. What kind of sequence corresponds to each model? Um, well, this looks as if it keeps adding three. Oh, oh, I like that. I, we can say something even better. So this is starting at four. So I'm going to write that starting at four. We add, and I say add because adds right here. We add three X times. 3 being the one right here, x being from right here. All right, sound good? Hopefully that works for you, works for me, definitely. Um, what's up with the rest? Exponential, what kind of sequence is this? So this is similar, but now starting at 4. We, well, what operation do you think is going on here? Hopefully you're saying multiply by three X times. So very similar. They're both starting at four, but this is multiplying by three X times. This was just adding three X times. Starting point here would be zero four, and then just keeps adding on three. So four plus three gets you seven. Keep that momentum going. Two to seven to 10, three to 13. All good. Um, what's up here? Well, when X is zero, we're starting with four. And then here we keep multiplying. Terrible arrow. Um, we keep multiplying by three. All right. So four times three gets you 12. 12 times three gets you 36. Three times 36 gets you large number. What do you think it is? Well, if you multiply it by three, you definitely have 90 and you have an additional 18. So 108, feeling great. Okay. Find the rate of change. Rate of change in this case is our slope. And our slope in this case was three. In this case, our common ratio is three. So not quite the slope. Don't get those confused. Not quite the slope. Graph these out, compare the graphs. What's the same? Well, think about what we mentioned before. I'll get a straight line for this. So with this one, recall that this is four X, sorry, four plus three X, okay? So we're starting at four and then we keep, uh, I don't like how that one looks. So starting at four, we keep adding three X, okay? So we're going over one, up three, and then that just keeps going. And I'll map out some of these points so you can see them too. So over one, up three, that's a huge deal. Oh, and this is actually occurring over one. All right, so this is slightly altered, okay. So over one, yeah, this is, yikes. All right, we still got this though. I'll break down some of these points. So one seven was the next point. And then we hit 210, which we definitely have there. And then it's gonna keep going. It looks like that. Not the biggest fan of how they altered these, but um, so noteworthy points was again, starting at four. And then also getting one seven, and then also two ten, 
And then also 313, 416. Hopefully those work for you. Common ratio, again, over here was three. So again, this is starting at four. We keep multiplying by three. So it jumped from four to 12. And then it's out of here. It's not coming back. That one's super easy to graph out though. It's just gonna keep going up and up like Tuesday. So simple, find the y-intercept for each function. They're both at zero comma four. Positive four that is. So notice different types of graphs. This again was exponential, so it's curved. This was linear on the left, so it's a straight line. Hope that makes sense. Um, I'll leave seven up to you and eight up to you. Determine which form of equation would be the most efficient to use what is needed. See page one of task 2.6 for the five forms of equation. Okay, got that. Um, that'll be in your textbook. So what's up here? Jasmine has been working to save money. Shout out to Jasmine. And wants to have an equation to model the amount of money in her bank account. In my bank account. Yeah, in my bank account. She's been depositing $175 a month consistently. She doesn't remember how much money she deposited initially. So whenever I see this, I'm thinking that the y-intercept, we don't know. I write f of zero because that's the same thing as the y-intercept, but you could say the same thing for equal to b. However, on her last statement, she saw that her account has been open for 10 months, okay? So this is something we can model. So this is saying that f of 10 equals 2,475, create the equation, all right? Well, since this is depositing 175 consistently, really, this is saying that there's a consistent rate of change. And if it's a consistent rate of change, is it linear? Is it exponential? Is it neither? Hopefully you're saying it's linear, all right? So this is saying that over the span of 10 months, we accrue this amount. We don't know f of zero. So I'll make that, what linear form are we choosing? We're choosing linear, or do we need it? What do you think? We can actually just get away with point slope. Let me tell you why. We have an X chord in it. We have a Y chord in it. We know our slope, our consistent rate of change, which is just M. So we can say that M is equal to 175. So if we set this up, Y minus Y1, which is 2,475 equals our slope 175 X minus 10, that would work just fine. If you wrote it to 175 X minus 10 plus 2,475, that also works just fine. Personally, I like this one, the second one a lot better because I like having the Y1 term on the other side of the equation. Hope that helps. Uh, let's see if we can get one that's exponential. Let's see. Okay, so uh, let's see this table. Table shows the number of rectangles created every time there's a fold made through the center of the paper. Use this table for each, uh, for each question, all right? So I know that it's jumping from two to four, which is normally adding two, but then it jumps four to eight. So I know that this is definitely exponential, but why? Why do you think this is exponential? Well, hopefully you're saying because it keeps multiplying. So when I look at this, I'm thinking that it keeps multiplying by two every time it moves forward and it keeps just adding one fold, okay? So I would say that my uh, common ratio is gonna be two. 
And then what do you think at zero folds? At zero folds, can there be anything? It's just one. And then I'm gonna put this as X. So this is our equation. So my starting term, if I went back to zero, the zero term would just be one. So that's why I have this one here. Two, we kept multiplying by two over and over. Hope that helps. Find the number of rectangles created with 14 folds. All right, we can do that. 14 folds. Well, we know that this is two and then instead of X, we're putting in 14. So this is two to the 14 power. That's a pretty big number, but it makes sense how this is gonna keep going. That would get you 16,384. Cool, hope that helps. Um, which equation? I mean, we're using the same one, so it's still this one. Um, if we were using this equation, it goes down here. So hope that helps. Oh, and it wants us to find five folds. All right, sure. Yeah, we'll just keep multiplying by two. Sorry, I forgot that this problem was asking about that. That's simple. Just keeps multiplying by two. So there are 32 rectangles when there are, are five folds. There's 16,384 when there's 14 folds. Hope that helps. All right. This one is solving each equation with the properties. Justify your answer by identifying the properties you use to get it. We have some properties here, pretty simple. Um, we're just trying to solve it pretty much. So 3x equals 15. I know that this is going to be involving division. So this is using the multiplication property of equality first, because I can divide both sides by three, or yeah, multiply by one half, or in this case, one third. Okay, so three over three X equals 15 over three. This leaves us with one X equals five from the multiplicative identity, multiplying with its reciprocal x equals five. That's like right here. Yeah, like these two steps show that. Um, 16 shouldn't be too tricky. Those other ones are just stating the same kind of thing. But the goal here for the go is that you're trying to think out how these terms or steps work and why they work and giving reason to them. So I hope that this video helped. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks for watching.